the Malakirti experience part six uh, in which we discuss chapter nine the famous chapter of entering the dharma door of non-duality um, so that's the theme of tonight um, in in many ways uh, when uh, michael taft and i first sat down together and started uh, cooking up this idea of, of doing a uh, coordinated classes um, this, this chapter, which is kind of considered the, the highlight of the whole sutra that we're talking about here, the, the Malakirti Sutra, um, it's considered the highlight, but it was also kind of me and, and Michael Taft's, you know, favorite, favorite chapter. Um, and so it's really where he and I connected and said, yeah, let's, you know, let's do a, uh, some class series together and we'll call it... <laughs> entering the dharma door of non-duality like they that's what the vinalakirti experience is all about um and so tonight's the night in many ways everything all the first five parts was leading up to tonight um but as usual i'm going to take a minute to bring us back up to speed of where we are um um, like many sutras and like many Mahayana sutras, this is a narrative. This is a story that's been unfolding. These events have been taking place in, in movements, which we would call chapters. Um, and so I wanted to walk us through that again, because it's, it, it's really hard to dive right into the Dharma door of non-duality chapter um, when really the whole sutra has been built uh, 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 built upon getting to this point. Um, so, very quickly, uh, this is a um, you know a Buddhist sutra. So, thus have I heard once, once, once upon a time, we were in Vaishali. We were in the city of Vaishali, and the Buddha was there. And in the first chapter of this sutra, we are introduced to this idea of a, a Buddha land, a Buddha Kshetra, a Buddha field. Uh, Robert Thurman translates this word as Buddha field. And the first chapter was an opener, an opening, and it was about purifying Buddha lands or purifying these Buddha fields. And that's when we were sort of first introduced to this, uh, you know, this isn't going to be your regular old sutra. Um, some wild things happen in the first chapter. Um, and again, it introduces this um, new type of buddhism which, which is a mahayana type of buddhism really kind of wild stuff and that's what we're here to talk about tonight it's really wild stuff then we were introduced in chapter two to this guy vimalakirti a layman and that's actually where the sutra really starts to become very interesting because whereas in sutras we're we're used to the buddha dispensing the knowledge like that's how it works the, the the monks ask the question and buddha dispenses the wisdom and that's that's it but in this sutra all of a sudden things are uh, gonna work a little differently because this lay person vimalakirti is gonna give discourses to the people is gonna give discourses to everybody so again chapter two is really where we realize oh this is a very different kind of sutra when it's not even the buddha who's, go who's going to be telling us this stuff all right we are also introduced to this sort of uh the plot the the plot of the story which is that vimalakirti is sick he's ill and so all the townspeople of vaishali come to check on him and the buddha thinks it would be a good idea of if he and the, all his disciples go check on Vimalakirti, the, the layman who's sick. And in this kind of chapter three, we are introduced to the disciples, the Shravakas. These are a group of 10 uh, monks, renunciants, mendicants that sort of have, uh, as I've been teaching it, teach, most people teach this sutra that way that these disciples represent an older form of Buddhism, an earlier form of Buddhism in the world today. A surviving remnant of it is this Theravada tradition of Southeast Asia. But it's this idea of a really austere renunciatory path. And these disciples are all intimidated <laughs> by this lay person, Vimalakirti, and his wisdom. So they, one by one, declined to go see him. And then in chapter four, we're introduced to the great bodhisattvas. In many ways, this sutra is about the bodhisattva path, becoming a bodhisattva, being a bodhisattva. 
And even these adept bodhisattvas refused to go see the layman Vimalakirti uh, until finally the crown prince of the Dharma Manjushri, this high, high adept bodhisattva, bodhisattva of wisdom, uh, finally agrees to the Buddha's request to go see Vimalakirti. And before everybody shows up to Vimalakirti's house, he performs a magic trick. No other word for it, really, in which he makes his house empty. And it's in that chapter uh, five when Vimalakirti is like, ooh, every, Manjushri, the Bodhisattvas and disciples, everybody's coming over. I will make my house empty. And what really that is, is the beginning of a discourse or a discussion about this Buddhist idea of emptiness. Manjushri and Vimalakirti get into ideas of emptiness. That's in chapter five, really kind of laying out this idea. And then in chapter six, it's sort of our minds are blown. This is the entry into the inconceivable. The inconceivable is a, it's a liberation. Uh, it's called a vimoksha. It's actually where this word dharma door comes from, is a, the liberation or a vimoksha. And so Vimalakirti, again, teaches us all this samadhi, a contemplation, a meditative state that is really kind of a profound thing that is about displacing the axis of the self, clinging to the axis of the self. And what prompts this desire, this need actually, to displace the axis of the self and ideas of limitations of the self, what prompts this is that all these giant thrones fall from the sky from some other realm into Vimalakirti's house. They fill the house and all of these disciples, they can't, they can't sit on these giant thrones. The bodhisattvas, of course, are adept in this meditation, this, this liberation of the inconceivable. And so they're able to grow their bodies and sit on these thrones. And then Malakirti has to teach the disciples how to do that. They were still so limited in their sense of self <laughs> is sort of the idea of that chapter. And then things get really wild in chapter seven, the goddess in which all these flowers start falling from the sky. They, they're sticking to the disciples. They're falling off the bodhisattvas. And this is sort of this introduction to the hangups, the hangups that the disciples have, the hangups around adorning themselves, the hangups around male-female things, the hangups around all kinds of stuff. That the, the Shravaka path, that old school renunciatory path was still a little clinging, clinging to rules, clinging to discipline in that way, ironically. And so then the bodhisattvas then, or, or the bodhisattvas teach the disciples how to appreciate the adornments of the flowers and not to discriminate them. That's sort of the heart of that chapter seven. And then last chapter, the family of the Buddhas, the family of the Tathagatas. This was sort of a culminating chapter in this um, what could be called the conversion of the disciples, the conversion of the Shravakas to this new way of thinking about Buddhism, a new, a new way of thinking about the Dharma. It's predicated on the old way of thinking about the Dharma. It comes right out of it. Um, but the Shravakas or the disciples aren't really used to that way of thinking. And so Chapter eight is sort of this culmination of them coming around to it, them understanding it, right? And I wanted to, well, and then that brings us to chapter nine, this uh, Dharma door of non-duality, right? So as you can see here, the board is full of bodhisattvas. And these are, of course, all the bodhisattvas that appear in this chapter that we're going to read tonight. I am going to try to give them each at least a moment of shine tonight, you know. Um, now, there, there's a lot I have to say about these bodhisattvas. Now, in this chapter, interestingly enough, there's the, the disciples are gone. They're not present. And if you were here for the first chapter, or if you listened to the first chapter, you heard 
a litany, a retinue of bodhisattvas, over 50 different bodhisattvas that were basically going to Vimalakirti's house, right? So there was 32,000 bodhisattvas of which the sutra lists like 50. And there were a bunch of these disciples and they all go there. And now in this chapter, after the disciples have seen the light, after they've embraced the adornments, after they've understood the seeds of Buddhahood and where Buddhas come from, <laughs> where Buddhas are born, that was sort of the premise of the last chapter, where do Bud Buddhas come from? Where are they born? Well, so after that, there's this sort of idea that the, the again, that the Shravakas or the disciples have seen the light, that they've converted to this new way this Mahayana, Mahayana, this great vehicle. And so it's possible that all these new bodhisattvas that pop up in the chapter we're about to read could be new Dharma names for our newly converted uh, disciples. Some of them maybe, some, some of them have hints that that might be what's going on. Others are actually very well-established bodhisattvas, very well-established figures in Buddhism, so not. So I just want you to kind of keep that in mind that we're not exactly sure who all these characters are. Are the disciples in the background? Are they in the foreground? So I just want to, in terms of tying this into the narrative, I want you to know that. And, it, and the reason why I'm bringing this up is that this chapter, which chapter six, beginning on page 50 here in the Thurman translation, it begins immediately with thereupon, well, thereupon what? <laughs> like, wait, wait, time out. Thereupon, well, the idea is, is that if you were here for the last chapter, whoa, sorry, I'm in the wrong spot. This chapter starts then, sorry, then. <laughs> but if you were here for chapter eight, if you were here for the last chapter, I, what I read was Vimalakirti's poem. He recited this beautiful 42 stanza poem that was describing the Bodhisattva's family. And, you know, not their, the family that they were maybe uh, physically born into, but this Dharma family, a family of virtues, a family of wisdom, all of these ideas. So that's what happens at this culmination of the last chapter. And so the idea here is, is that if it's a narrative, that it's like everybody is in ecstasy now like that we've reached the culmination it's like oh my gosh we've had it all wrong this whole time oh we get it we get it so then so then the lichavi vimalakirti asked those bodhisattvas virtuous ones please explain how the bodhisattvas enter the dharma door of non-duality and then one by one we're going to go through each of these bodhisattvas who give in all of the languages that we're working with here the original languages of this text uh, tibetan sanskrit and chinese each of these bodhisattvas give a basically a one two-line verse quick little thing about how they entered the dharma door of non-duality before we even touch on it, though, before we even think about this, we got to do a big, 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 big debrief breakdown, back it up, beep, 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 because this idea of non-duality, it's so tricky. You know, it's one of those words or one of those ideas that's just like upon just upon its utterance, you, you know, you fall into a mystical trance, right? No, non, non-duality. You know, it just has this air of, of prof profundity, right? And indeed, it's a very profound idea. A very, it's a very old idea. And so the, the first thing I have to lay out before we even hear a word from any of these bodhisattvas, I have to lay out that this, that's what's about to happen here well, it's, been, it's what's been happening the whole sutra, which is this Mahayana, this Mahayana Buddhism, it's, it's um, well, 
again, the whole sutra has been about the old form of Buddhism, which unto itself was profound. <laughs> but the old form of Buddhism versus this new form, which is like even more profound. So the whole sutra is based on this sort of like, this, this, this ain't your daddy's Buddhism, right? This isn't your daddy's non-duality. This isn't, we're doing next level non-duality is where I'm going with this. So if you, even if you're familiar with non-duality, I want you to know this is a different kind of non-duality because, well, for those actually, for everybody, for all of us, wonderful people in, in, the, in, in the Zoom room here, if you're not familiar with this idea of non-duality, like the old school, your daddy's non-duality, the old school one, I, I just want you to know this is basically what we're talking about tonight. And when I say basically, it's like uh, as, a, as a movement, as like a, a movement. And what I mean by that is, is that dualism, so the opposite of right. So if we're talking about non-duality, duality, the main way of thinking about duality is due, right? Two, M me and you, or me and it, me and the clock, got a clock, me and the clock me and the computer, me and the you. So the duo is anything that is predicated on me and it. What, you know, fancy talk, they say subject, object, right? But it's like that idea of creating a, a, a barrier, a distance, a gap between me and you, me and it. That's duality. So non-duality, traditionally, basically, simply put, is a kind of collapsing of that duality into what could be called a, a monism, oneness, a sort of one. It, it's not me and you, it's one. Or it's not me and you, it's all, all one. The totality of all things are one. So there's sort of this movement, and, and a, classic, a classic example of this, of course, is the, the wave in the ocean right that each 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 wave on the surface thinks it's a unique wave a unique because it sees the separation between each wave but underneath they're all ocean it's all ocean all a big ocean with momentary rises and falls and you're a momentary rising and falling out of the ocean great ocean of being and i'm a momentary rising and falling out of the great ocean of being but together we're all just the great ocean of being. So that idea of like the, the it's, it's ignorant or it's even just sort of like, you know, bad, uh, it's, uh, it looks bad to have this sort of dualism, right? And so the idea is to collapse again, the dualism into like a oneness. That's like old school though. That's simple dimple to that's that idea. But I, so I want you to know, so just that simple movement of, of um, well, what could we call it? Kind of a collapsing, right? Like thinking of that movement of like a, of a, of a collapsing from when it was separated to oneness. We're just going to kind of work with that. But what I want you to know is that this is a beautiful sutra that's going to walk us through deeper ideas of non-duality. So questions about that real quick? Um, yeah, Mike, Michael, the um, so so, uh, so just be on the lookout because because the it sounds like the like no self kind of sits within the non dual experience. Like you could, you know, it sort of uh, it, it 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 um yeah, no self sits inside of that. And when what they're talking about is like deeper than just kind of you are your experience. Uh, yep that concept you hold on Sri Gupta you, <laughs> you hold on the guy already held thanks okay okay so again I just wanted you to all to know that the dualism the like dualism non-duality what would be called Advaita or uh, Advayata Ad, Advayatva that idea of Advaita non-duality very old idea in, in many ways, sort of basic Buddhism is a kind of form of non-duality already. 
so I just want you to know that that where we're going with this is sort of like um, well I've used this example a lot and I think it's really um, it's a perfect it's a perfect example because of Vimala Vimala the guy's name Vimala Kirti Vimala is this idea of like um, it's pure, but it, it means like without a flaw, like without error, like totally perfect in a way. But it's an interesting Vimala within the Buddhist context is a very interesting idea. Because, and here, here's lesson number one, folks, on, on the non-duality, right? The idea, the Buddhist non-duality. The idea is, is that we have a tendency to call things either like dirty and clean, even just to like, you know, uh, uh, better wash my hands. That was dirty. I'm, I, I'm good. That was clean. So dirty, clean, pure, impure. That is a dualism. Absolute malt, right? That's definitely a dualism. So what the Buddha is talking about in all these sutras and what the Malakirti and the gang have been talking about is that to not to not judge things as pure or impure that's pure that's vimala or flip it to judge things as pure and impure that's impure that'll get you dirty wash your hands after you discriminate please right that's that the idea of that is is that subtle shift of oh duality pure and impure yeah dualisms yeah so i just want you to know that that's the realm we're playing in because what it's going to be hap what's going what is going to be happening here is this idea of dual non-dual let's transcend even that and that's where these bodhisattvas are going to take us so i just wanted you to just be prepared that that um what can I say? Like, this is a very famous chapter because uh, people are like interested in non-duality. They want to know about non-duality. And this chapter is, is about non-duality, but it's a, this special subtle type of non-duality that I want to share with you all tonight. So I had to say all that in order to, to, to share it. Um, this is the gateway of the boo or -er. Oh, the, also, yeah. On that note, using a lot of languages, san a lot of Sanskrit tonight, and probably a lot of Chinese. And the reason why I'm doing that is that I've shared with you on a number of nights that there's three Chinese versions of this that, I that I'm using. One that goes from the year 220 AD. That's the oldest one. And then one from 400 and then one from about 660. And this is from a guy, a Chinese monk that walked all the way from China to India to get a better Sanskrit copy of the Vimalakirti and other sutras. And to, because he thought these two had some problems and errors. And so he walked all the way to India, spent 17 years in India, came all the way back and was like, all right, guys, I got it. So I trust this version because this guy spent a big chunk of his life trying to make sure that these were right or figure out what's wrong. So I've been using all of these. Just want you to know. And what I mean by that is that if you're following along in the Thurman, I'm going to be taking a lot of sidesteps and digressions and things like that. And I'm going to try to explain as much as I can as I go along. But I just wanted you to know that. I got a lot, a lot to say tonight, folks. So buckle up. Again, this is, pro this is progressive. Each of these statements is gonna be more and more. I'm gonna keep my eye on the clock. I might have to bunch a few of these together. Um, I'm not gonna be able to really jump on chat or anything like that, so I hope everybody is good. After the Lichavi, Vimalakirti asks all the bodhisattvas, how did you enter the gateway of non-duality? The Bodhisattva, Dharma Vikarvana, declared, Noble Sir, production and destruction are two, but what is not produced and does not occur cannot be destroyed. Thus, 
the attainment of the tolerance of the birthlessness of all things is the entrance into non-duality. Yeah, folks, and that's just number one, right? So real quick, and this, but it's easy. It's easier than it all sounds. So we heard, I believe we were, I did it, I broke it down in chapter four, that I broke down this idea that is, it's the, uh, a dominant theme in this sutra, which is the birthlessness of all phenomena or the non-production of all phenomena, non-origination of all phenomena. All the same idea for this idea of, well, if you've got something, let's say I've got a clock, right? The idea of, a, of any entity, any object, anything, what I'm about to say goes for anything and everything you could possibly conceive of. But you take like a clock, right? And as soon as you have the fixed idea of an object, there's some kind of baggage, like conceptual baggage that comes along with the idea of this being an object, which is that it must have come from somewhere and it must be going somewhere. And what we're really concerned about philosophically is the origination of this clock and then the destruction of this clock. Where did it come from? How did it get made? What is it made out of? And then at what point will it decay, break apart or fall apart? At what point can I, will it cease to be? At what point was it not, right? Like beforehand, at what point was it not? When did it come into being? When did it go out of being? And so you talk about the non-origination of all dharmas, the non-origination of all phenomena, or we use the language of birthless. And that is that, if, let's say I'm not talking about a clock, let's say I'm talking about a dude. And as soon as you got a dude, that dude came from somewhere and is going from somewhere. And in very similar fashion, the idea is that there was a, there was a day before the dude. There was a day before I existed. And then I was born. And then I lived, am currently living, and then headed to decay, falling apart, destruction, death. And then there will not be the dude. <laughs> but that's all if that's all predicated on or is based on a certain understanding of beings, dudes, clocks, right? So what this whole sutra is, and I can't do it. I, I got I got bodhisattvas to talk about. This whole sutra has been unpacking this idea to arrive at a patient tolerance for the birthlessness of all things, that actually things don't come from anywhere, they don't go from anywhere. Beings don't, are not born and don't die. They don't come from anywhere, they don't go from anywhere. And I'm about to drop on you very, very quickly a, a very simple... Uh, kind of a magic trick, a very simple magic trick that will demonstrate to you what we're talking about. This ties a lot into last class. So if you were here last class for the discussion of bijas, seeds, these like conceptual seeds, right? We're going to be piggybacking off that idea. If you weren't here, don't worry. The magic trick is still fun and it'll still get to the point, right? So I'm going to show you something. Oh, bam. Do you see it? <laughs> right? So here's the thing about it. I, I'm not going to play the game of asking everybody, like, what is that? What do you do? I'm just going to say, like, so do you see the fist? I'm, I'm holding up my fist, right? I want you to pay very, very careful attention to the fist. And I want you to tell me, where did the fist go? Did it, did it go somewhere? Did the fist go anywhere? Let me ask you something else. Oh, did the fist come from anywhere? Was it born? Was it made in a factory in China? Does it, did it come from it? So let's talk about this fist for a moment, shall we? 
what is the what is the real nature of this fist is is it is it created and destroyed I, you know because the last time i checked things being created and destroyed and things being born and dying it's a lot more dramatic than this i gotta tell you last time i checked things do not so easily come in and out of existence unless we understand the nature of their existence as you know little what did i call it last week there's these little like uh, conceptual you know they're part of con a conceptual framework they're part of a language game fist fingers dudes clocks these are all words for perception of things but what the fist and so i'm just going to drop it here because the bodhisattva is going on, on but if you keep remembering or thinking about the fist man it just keeps coming in and out of existence right so maybe this fist maybe the nature of this fist isn't what we think it is so pay just think about that but our uh Pusa. What's really interesting about Dharma, what Dharma Vikarvana, Dharmishvara, as his name appears in the opening chapter, his name is uh, Dharmishvara, Dharma Ishvara, Dharma Lord, and Dharma Lord says this is this is his answer to non-duality, right? He says production and destruction are two. But what is not produced and does not occur cannot be destroyed. Thus, the attainment of the tolerance of the birthlessness of things is the entrance into non-duality. And so if you're cool with understanding, oh, the fist is kind of real, and if it hits me, that's reality and dukkha. But I'm showing you that, uh, that fist is a concept you have for a pattern a form of some fingers and a you know and the you know of course the funny game to play is tell me when tell me when it stops being a fist is it there yet is it there yet okay no more fist right so again the idea is that if you're thinking of a fist or a clock or a person as an entity that came from somewhere and went somewhere you're done you missed it if you're understanding clocks and people and everything as kind of con conceptual conglomerations in your mind, now we're on the right track. That's what we're talking about. Okay, I'm going to keep it moving because, again, this is cumulative. The Bodhisattva Sri Gupta, that was our a moment ago, Sri Gupta piped up and said, I and mine are two. If there is no presumption of a self, there will be no possessiveness. Thus, the absence of presumption is the entrance into non-duality. So again, this is very subtle. The, the old school duality was me and you. And it was like, me and you is a duality, right? This is saying, I and mine is a duality, right? My clock, I and mine. If there is no presumption of a self, because the self is like a fist, a con concept, selves, fists, exactly the same nature, by the way. So this idea of I and my are two, if there is no presumption of a self, then there will be no possessiveness. If there's no self, how can there be a, a, somebody clinging to something? How could there be a clock? I just told you no clock and no dude. No clock and no dude. So I and mine are two. But if there's no presumption of a self, there will be no possessiveness. Thus, the absence of presumption is the entrance into non-duality. Bodhisattva number three which in the Chinese is, is different, and I'm sticking with Xuanzang, my man. I'm going down to the Bodhisattva Animisha. Animisha is uh, never blinking. <laughs> That's what his name means, never blinking. 
It's just like that, right? So, uh, um, Annie Misha declared grasping and not grasping are two. What is not grasped is not perceived. And what is not perceived is neither presumed nor repudiated. Thus, the inaction and non-involvement of all things is the entrance into non-duality. So again, this is pretty wild because he's saying, like, clinging, grasping, Oh, right. That was the Four Noble Truths. The dukkha was caused by the clinging. And the Buddha told me not to cling. And then that's nirvana. And that's, that's peace and tranquility, not to cling. Nope, sorry, duality head, right? Grasping and then not grasping. That, it's a duality, right? What is, this is a good one. What is not grasped is not perceived. That thing that you weren't thinking about 10 minutes ago, that's what we're talking about. That, how could you possibly grasp that? Right? Bodhisattva number four. Keep an eye on that clock. Bodhisattva number four. Shri Kuta. This uh, heap or this heap or peak of uh, virtue. This is a good one. I already kind of primed us for this one. Sri, uh, where are you at? Sri Kuta declared, defiled and pure are two. When there is thorough knowledge of defilement, there will be no conceit about purification. The path leading to the complete conquest of all conceit is the entrance into non-duality. So this is a classic one. I, I, again, I primed us. This idea of defiled and pure, clean and dirty, that's a total duality. When there is thorough knowledge of defilement, let me, let me just fill in the parentheses. When there is thorough knowledge of the empty nature of all defilement, right? That's the idea. When there is thorough understanding of the empty nature of all defilement, there will be no conceit about being pure. That's pure, right? That's the Vimala I talked about before. Everybody doing good? We're going to start moving along here. Bodhisattva. Uh, uh, su okay, so this actually introduces a few different things. Uh, uh, this is a Nakshastra, Su Nakshastra. And actually, I'm going to start. I just want to mention this now. A Nakshastra is a, a lunar mansion, a lunar constellation. Very kind of interesting idea in Indian and Buddhist uh, uh, astrology. And there's a lot of astrology on the board, actually. A lot of these bodhisattvas, this is going to be the first that I'm going to point out. This bodhisattva's name is the name of one of these constellations, one of these Nakshastras. And so that starts to give us a sort of a little insight into the deeper meaning of this chapter. So there's a few layers now going on. We're going to be obviously talking non-duality here, but there's a deeper level of the meaning of kind of all of this on the board. And so this Sunakshastra declared that being mindfully focused and attended or being totally distracted are two. When there is no distraction, there will be no attention, no mentation, no mental intensity. Thus, the absence of mental intensity is the entrance to non-duality. So this is kind of a middle path between super focused concentration on X, Y, or Z, or very loose distracted. I'm not focusing on X, Y, or Z. Very, actually very akin to the meditations Michael Tass been walking us through on Thursdays. Those really meditations that have no object, sort of in that family. Bodhisattva number six. Bodhisattva wonderful eye, Sunetra. This is a hard one, and I'm not going to be able to spend too much time on this, but this is a heavy one. He's, he says that uh, it's this idea of that 
that which only has one characteristic, an elemental characteristic, something, you know, maybe like space or something, but something that only kind of has one characteristic. The unique is how it's translated here, or just the idea of uniqueness. But what they're actually talking about is something with only one lakshana, one sign. So that, and no signs, signlessness. That's two. Not to presume or construct something is neither to establish its uniqueness nor to establish its characteris characterlessness or signlessness. To penetrate the equality of these two is to enter non-duality. So that's a heavy one. It's a lot of discussion about Lakshana, these signs, and this idea of like the sign and the signless are now dualism. And so to transcend that, I'm going to have to leave you be with that because if you're familiar with Lakshanic thinking, thinking of characteristics, and in particular thinking of the signless, we just went past the signless folks. The Animita, Cheto Samadhi, the signless Samadhi, we just, woo, rocket ship past it, all right? And then number seven, the Bodhisattva Subahu declared, and this is Bodhisattva Wonderful Arm, by the way, which may correspond to the Western zodiacal, zodiac, zodiacal sign of Sagittarius, if, if you're curious about that. But Bodhisattva Subahu declared, the bodhisattva path and the disciple path are two. When both are seen to resemble an illusory spirit, an illusory nature, there is no bodhisattva and there is no disciple. Thus, the sameness of natures of spirit is the entrance into non-duality. Right? So even this whole time, when we've been positing the disciples against the bodhisattvas, we reach a point in the text where it says, oh yeah, and by the way, that whole disciple bodhisattva discrimination, dualism, yeah, not that either, right? Because we're done with that. Again, no disciples to be found in that way, or they are there to be found. Okay, so we're doing good. Next on our list is bodhisattva pushya. Pushya is also a, a nakshastra, also a constellation. Uh, and this is uh, Pusha. I believe this is Pusha here. Well, I won't get bogged down with that, but our Bodhisattva Pusha, he says, this is Nietzsche. Hey, Nietzsche, listen up. Bodhisattva Pusha says, good and evil are two. Right? Seeking neither good nor evil. The understanding of the non-duality of the significant and the meaningless is the entrance into non-duality. So good and evil, right? Friedrich Nietzsche, right? German guy, German philosopher writes this book, Beyond Good and Evil. Not, I don't, not quite what he had in mind, not quite. Not, you know, they're related, but it's a little different. But this Bodhisattva Pushya, this, con this constellation Bodhisattva, Good and evil. Judging things as good, judging things as evil, that's two. Seeking neither good nor evil. The understanding of the non-duality of the significant and the meaningless. That's the entrance into non-duality. Wow. <laughs> the... the significant and meaningless do you see what i'm talking about with the significant and meaningless think about think about oh go back to, to last week think about an alphabet think about letters you see letters and they are significant they're signs they're truly significant right they 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 have meaning in your mind right and then you go walk out uh, and see a bunch of leaves on the ground insignificant it has no meaning transcend that idea of significant and insignificant something is having meaning and significance and something is not go beyond that 
that's the entrance to non-duality. Everybody good? All right, because again, we're gonna, I'm gonna try to again, touch on at least everyone for a moment, just to say a word. The next two, Bodhisattva Lion, Bodhisattva Simha, and Bodhisattva Simha Mati, Lion Mind, right? So Bodhisattva Lion, which may correspond to Leo, it's starting to look like this is corresponding to Leo. Bodhisattva Lion, Simha, declared sin and sinless, or sinful and sinlessness, right? To have sin, to not have sin, are two. By means of a Vajra-like wisdom that pierces to the quick, not to be bound or to be liberated. That is the entrance into non-duality. So a lot of this should be, you know, moving right along, of course, good and evil. And of course, if there's no such thing as good and evil, then sin and sinless, right? Committing good or evil, no such thing as that, right? But with a Vajra-like wisdom that pierces to the quick, not to be bound by ideas of, not to be bound or to be liberated, right? Our lion-like mind set, takes it one step further. They're all taking it one step further. But Bodhisattva Simhamati, lion mind, said to say this is perfect and to say this is not perfect makes for a duality. One who, attaining equanimity, forms no concept of impurity or immaculateness, perfect and imperfect, yet is not utterly without conception, has equanimity without if any attainment of equanimity. That person enters the absence of all conceptual knots and thus enters into non-duality. Perfect, imperfect, equanimity between the two, right? One who attaining that equanimity between perfect and imperfect forms no conception of perfect and imperfect, yet is not entirely without conception. Little side note, little parenthetical there, right? They have equanimity without attainment of equanimity. Little, little twist there, right? So this equanimity we're talking about cannot, no, no, not that equanimity, the, the real equanimity. Okay. Uh, our next bodhisattva in line is Sukad, Sukha Dimukti. Sukha Dimukti. And bodhisattva um, Sukha Dimukti is, uh, is interesting. Bl a blissful, a sukha filled liberation. Sukha Dimukti. And declared... To say that happiness is one thing and misery is another, that's a dualism. To speak of sukha and to speak of dukkha, that's the opposition in Sanskrit, right? To say this is happiness and this is misery, that's a dualism. One who is free of all calculations through the extreme purity of knowledge, their mind is aloof like empty space, and thus enters into non-duality. So, you know, that's kind of classic Buddhism there in that way of like neither sukha nor dukkha, it, like right in between the two there, right? One who's free from all calculations, all judgments of things in that way. So now... There's, so there's this, been this progression going on between like good and evil, sin and sinless, perfect, imperfect, joyful, unjoyful, right? We're kind of moving up some dhyana kind of ideas of escape or liberation or, or uh, vimoksha, if you will. And so Narayana, who is Vishnu, this is Bodhisattva Vishnu, did my best, a couple extra arms for to do Vishnu upright, right? Narayana is what he's called in this text, but we're talking about the god Vishnu, happens to be a bodhisattva, hangs out with other bodhisattvas. The bodhisattva Vishnu said, 
that to say that this is worldly, mundane, and that is transcendent, heavenly, that's a dualism. The world has the nature of emptiness, so there is neither transcendent nor involvement with it, neither progress nor standing still. Thus, neither to transcend the world nor to be involved in the world, neither to go nor to stop. This is the entrance to non-duality. Right? So, interesting to have God or a God, Vishnu, whose like realm is heaven, whose realm is the transcendent, saying the worldly and the transcendent, that's a dualism, right? Then the Bodhisattva Dantamati declared samsara and nirvana, the classic, the cycle of death and rebirth, and nirvana, liberation, extinction of suffering, right? Samsara and nirvana, that's dualistic. Having seen the nature of life, one neither belongs to it, nor is one utterly liberated from it. Such understanding is the entrance into non-duality. Then Bodhisattva Pratya, Pratyakdarshana declared, this is a very interesting one. So this Bodhisattva declares that destructible and indestructible are dualistic. What is destroyed is ultimately destroyed. What is ultimately destroyed does not become destroyed. Hence, it is called indestructible. What is indestructible is instantaneous, and what is instantaneous is indestructible. The experience of such is called the entrance into the principle of non duality. So, Pause on this Bodhisattva really quickly. Uh, not next chapter, but the chapter after that is called The Lesson of the Destructible and the Indestructible. It, it's about this idea. So I'm not going to dwell on it too long because we're going to basically spend a whole night on this idea. But it goes right. It's basically, it's the same idea of the birthlessness of all things. The destruction of all things. This idea that things come into existence and go out of existence that things have a beginning and then things have an end right so this is the idea of destruction and then indestructible well of course is this idea of like i don't know you know the the divine or the you know it's this idea of like indestructibility and in many ways when i'm doing the fist magic trick Right, and I'm kind of, and I'm showing you that that the fist is is neither created nor destroyed, right? It's like it's not working like that. If you understand that, I just put an end. I just destroyed the destroyed. I just destroyed it. That right? I I totally destroyed that idea of destruction. <laughs> That's that line. That great line. Right? What is destroyed is ultimately destroyed. The concept of the destroyed has been ultimately destroyed. And what is ultimately destroyed does not become destroyed. Right? Hence, it is called indestructible. Right? That's sort of a... Uh, again, again, there's a whole chapter on that idea of destructible and indestructibility. So I'm going to hold off on that. Uh... Bodhisattva number 15, uh, Pratyakshdarshana. No, that was the one we just did. Oh, no, 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 that was it. Da, da, da. Apologies. The Bodhisattva, uh, Pariguda, declared. This is an interesting one. Not that they're not all interesting. This Bodhisattva declared self 
and selflessness are dualistic. Atman and anatman are, is the Sanskrit language here. Self and selflessness. That's a dualism, Buddha. Even though you're the one that taught us all about this idea of anatman, the idea of atman and anatman is a dualism. Since the existence of the self, of an atman, since the existence of a self cannot be perceived, what is there to be made selfless? Thus, the non-dualism of the vision of their nature is the entrance into non-duality. Just think about that one, right? And while you're thinking about that one, Bodhisattva, Vidya Deva, Thunder God. Now I've been doing, as you see, I've been trying to do my research. I'm pretty sure this is Indra. There's not a lot of other gods that go around with the title Thunder God. So this might be Indra, just letting you know. But Vidya Deva, the Thunder God, he's, got, he's riding a lightning bolt. He declared, hold on, everybody. He declared knowledge and ignorance are dualistic. The natures of ignorance and knowledge are exactly the same. For ignorance is undefined and incalculable and beyond the sphere of thought. The realization of this is the entrance into non-duality. Oh, so like if you thought you knew anything a moment ago about self and selflessness, whatever knowledge you thought, and eh, check it at the door because that's another dualism. And again, so you see that how this is getting progressive and progressive where it's like good and evil. Okay, well, then no sin and no sinless. Oh, well, then nothing's perfect, nothing's imperfect. Well, then there's nothing mundane or transmundane and there's nothing samsaric. And, you know, it's like moving up and up and up. And now even the knowledge that I have acquired from all of this is a dualism. And now we arrive. Who I believe to be the star of the chapter, everybody. And the reason why I say that is that up until this point, again, Tibetan, Sanskrit, and all the Chinese versions, every bodhisattva up until now has given this very simple, this and this creates a dualism. Because this is this, it's ultimately empty, you can see that there's no such thing as a dualism. It's like very simple statement, da-da-da, therefore you see. And that's the, non, that's the door of non-duality. This bodhisattva here who's chilling, chilling on the, the Dharma door of non-duality, right? Uh, Priya Darshana, Priya Darshana. If you didn't know any better, you think Priya Darshana means good to look at. He's good looking. Might be good looking, but what's actually the story or the backstory on this bodhisattva who has, he's got his own sutra. He's actually bodhisattva that everyone in, in, in like gets happy seeing he's the the like the joyful like so it's not joyful to look at per se but he makes everybody happy <laughs> and so priya darshana declared matter itself is emptiness emptiness does not result from the destruction of matter but the nature of matter is itself emptiness. Therefore, to speak of emptiness on the one hand and matter on the other hand, or of sensations, perceptions, conditioning, or even consciousness, the other skandhas, on the one hand and emptiness on the other hand, is entirely dualistic. Consciousness itself is emptiness. Emptiness does not result from the destruction or cessation of consciousness, but the nature of consciousness is itself emptiness. Such understanding of the five aggregates and the knowledge of them as such by means of knowledge 
is the entrance into the gate of non-duality. So that was a much longer one, but I also, if you didn't hear it, that's the Heart Sutra, everybody. <laughs> Avilokiteshvara, practicing the profound pranyamaramita, clearly saw that the five aggregates are empty. Shariputra, form is emptiness, emptiness is form. Form is just emptiness, emptiness is just form. Sensation, perception, conditioning, and consciousness are also like this. This is the emptiness of all dharmas. So that's the hard sutra. I just recited the opening part of it. And that's just one little stanza in this chapter. So it's my suspicion that that's why this... Um, uh, axial figure, Priyadarshana, who actually kind of sits in the middle of the list of bodhisattvas, is this sort of sits as a special position. So just letting you know that one. And on that note of this sort of halfway point, how's everybody doing? Great. Doing good. Sweet. So I am going to speed it along because we only have a half hour and there's very important information at the end, right? And so what's interesting is, is that, the, so this Bodhisattva sets up this thing about um, matter, form, and voidness, emptiness. Um, shining Comet, Bodhisattva Shining Comet, our next one on the list here, he sets up an opposition between the four great elements and empty space. Very, very similar to the previous Bodhisattva of this idea of existence, and then non-existence, voidness, emptiness, and the idea that to, to arrive at real emptiness, you destroy the, the, the form. Nah, you missed it. If you're doing that, you miss what we're talking about. This is all about discrimination of anything as anything to begin with. Having form, being made of elements and space. So that's the next one there, this uh, Prabhaketu or Ketu. Prabhaketu up there talking about matter and space. Um, the next in our list, interesting, the Bodhisattva uh, Sumati, beautiful mind. Bodhisattva, beautiful mind. This Bodhisattva declares that the I and the, the object of form, that which is seen, the I and that which is seen creates a dualism. <laughs> Right to understand the I properly, correctly, and not to have attachment or aversion or any confusion with regard to visible forms. That is called peace. Similarly, the ear and sounds are a dualism, the nose and sense are a dualism, the tongue and tastes are a dualism, the body and tactiles are a dualism, and the mind and thoughts are a dualism. But to know the mind and to be neither attached to, averse, nor confused with regard to phenomena, that is called peace. To live in such peace is to enter into non-duality. So that's a heavy one because we're talking about what we perceive to be the perceptive organ and what we perceive to be the object of sight, the clock that I'm seeing, this is saying that's a dualism. If you, I give this one often, if you would like a little meditation on this particular non-dual door, if you want a particular meditation on how it could possibly be that the eye and the object are a false duality, you can think of a dream object that you think you're seeing that appears to be other than you and appears to be outside your brain mind perceiving organ. And yet they are one. So that's just a, a, a way to touch or meditate on this idea of the collapsing or unifying of the sense organs and their objects in that way. The next Bodhisattva up to bat is Akshyamati. Akshyamati actually has his own sutra, big time Bodhisattva, B-T-B, -B, right? This guy's got, oh, he's serious. And so Akshyamati declared, 
the dedication of generosity for the sake of attaining all knowledge, sarvanyana, is dualistic. Once again, the dedication of generosity for the sake of attaining omniscience is dualistic. This is a very a helpful um, passage for understanding the language of the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra or the Diamond Sutra that I've referenced a number of times. That sutra is this discourse about real giving and its relationship to pranya and jnana, knowledge, and transcendent knowledge. And it's a really interesting dialogue about giving and like what real giving is. And it's sort of like, well, without going too, too deep into it, because I do want to move this along, there's an implication here that the practice of giving, giving, dana but like giving giving yourself dedication giving your all giving your all that type of dedication giving that type of giving that that led to the development of sarvanyana all knowledge or omniscience this basically is saying that's a dualism and that's ultimately what the vajra sutra is saying as well so i just wanted to say that these are in dialogue in the same way that the uh this bodhisattva was sort of in dialogue or it was summarizing the Heart Sutra. This bodhisattva seems to be encapsulating the Vajra Sutra very well in that way. So this dedication of generosity for the sake of attaining omniscience, that's a dualism. The nature of generosity is itself omniscience. And the nature of omniscience is itself total dedication. Likewise, it is dualistic to dedicate discipline or moral discipline, tolerance, effort, dhyana meditation and wisdom, the other paramitas. It is a dualistic to dedicate the other paramitas for the sake of attaining omniscience. Omniscience is the nature of wisdom and total dedication is the nature of omniscience. Thus, the entrance into this principle of uniqueness is the entrance into non-duality. Okay, I'm going to pause there. That is an, on, an opener. Akshimati is an opener to these next five bodhisattvas that for the sake of time, I just have to summarize. They each present an essential teaching of the Buddha. The three doors of liberation, emptiness, signlessness, and wishlessness. This Buddha says those create a dualism. This Buddha says, this Bodhisattva says the three jewels, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha create a dualism, right? A triad, in fact, create, it's, it's worse than a dualism. It's like there's three, right? So the idea of that is that it's, that, Buddha, that Bodhisattva says that it's dualistic to say Buddha Dharma and Sangha, the three jewels. The Dharma is itself the nature of the Buddha. The Sangha is itself the nature of the Dharma. And all of them are uncompounded. The uncompounded is ak Akasha, infinite space. And the processes of all things are equivalent to infinite space. Adjustment to this is the entrance to non-duality. So to just give you a flavor of how some of those work, this one, kind of similar to our, our uh, Priya Darshana, but this one says the five aggregates and the, what is called the cessation of the five aggregates. He says, that's a dualism. The three actions, this is talking about karma. Body, speech, and mind, wholesome, unwholesome, neutral, depending on how you interpret it. He's saying those are a dualism. And then finally, the last one, uh, Punya Kshetra, Bodhisattva Punya Kshetra, uh, a field of merit. Bodhisattva, field of virtue, field of merit. 
He says merit and demerit, right? D that, that is a dualism. It's, he says it's dualistic to consider actions meritorious, sinful, or neutral. And then the non-undertaking of meritorious, sinful, and neutral actions is not dualistic. The intrinsic nature of all such actions is voidness or emptiness, wherein ultimately there is neither merit nor sin nor even neutrality, nor action itself. The non-accomplishment of such actions is the entrance into non-duality. Non so now at this point, you know, we're talking about, we're talking about those actions you didn't, didn't do. Yeah, all of those. We're talking about all of those actions you didn't do. Talking about all of the actions you did do. We're talking about whether those, all of those actions you didn't do <laughs> being sinful, not, or neutral, right? So this is getting really at the edges of, edges of conceptualization here we're getting into some serious like non non type of stuff right and so that brings me to the 26th bodhisattva in the list bodhisattva padma vyuha bodhisattva padma vyuha name whose name is The flower ornament. Padma Vyuha is the flower ornament bodhisattva. And so I keep holding this sutra up, the flower ornament sutra, because the, this Vimalakirti is, again, just, a, 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 just one facet of the garland sutra, right? Well, this is bodhisattva avatamsaka. This is bodhisattva flower garland, Padma Vyuha. And this bodhisattva up here in the flower garland above Vimalakirti's bed there, Padma Vyuha declared dualism itself, dualism is produced from obsession with self. But true understanding of self does not result in a dualism who thus abides in non-duality is without ideation. And that absence of ideation is the entrance to non-duality. Yeah. So if I might real quickly just summarize that one, dualism itself is produced from obsession with, and it says obsession with self. This is like, that that tricky use of atman that tricky use of self where yeah they mean a self but they also mean a self like a, a entity a clock and so the very conceptualization of clocks dudes whiteboards da 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 da, da the conceptualization of any objects itself the obsession the obsession with self right? That's what causes the dualism. But true understanding of self does not result in dualism. Very profound. I got a script. I got a script. Skip Sri Garba. Yep. Yeah, I'm just, uh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. This is another one where it says it's getting into non-action. So it's non-grasping and non-rejection. That's a dualism. So not, not even not re rejecting, not even not, yeah, it's, it's at that level. Then the cipher. This is the cipher, folks. Bodhisattva Chandrotara. The Bodhisattva moon hanging in midair. Bodhisattva top of the moon. That this is Bodhisattva top of the moon. Bodhisattva Chandrotara declared darkness and light are dualistic. 
but the absence of both darkness and light is non-duality. How is that? At the time of absorption in nirvana, cessation, there is neither darkness nor light. And likewise, with the natures of all things, the entrance into this equanimity is the entrance into non-duality. So really quickly, and I hate to do it such an injustice, there's a lot going on with this bodhisattva. One thing that's going on with this is I mentioned a few Dharma talks ago on this that, you know, and, and I keep referencing the Chinese versions of this because this, this sutra was very popular in China. A lot of these ideas were, the Chinese were very interested in concepts of non-duality and all of that. And so what's really being referenced here is yes, light and dark. And I could go on all night about light and dark and shadow and light and interesting stuff about that. But there's something that's helpful to know that's going on in the background of this particular Bodhisattva's um, uh, non-duality door. They're basically talking about yin and yang. And so this is like the Chinese mind itself is kind of dualistic in this way of thinking in terms of light and dark, of positive and negative, up and down. Fi you know, these, this, this elemental dualism of yin and yang is like what makes the whole universe go around and around. So when this bodhisattva drops this gem and jewel of wisdom about light and dark, the, the read, the Chinese read of it is yin and yang are a dualism, right? But the absence of both yin and yang, that's non-duality. Whoa, that's exciting, right? The second thing I want to say about Bodhisattva hanging in uh, uh, Bodhisattva full moon hanging in midair, who comes in by the way at number twenty eight. Number twenty eight very closely associated with lunations. There are twenty eight nakshastra. There are twenty eight lunar mansions. So what I'm starting to what I want to start dropping here, and I'm going to actually have to pick it back up <clears throat> really quickly is there's a way to read this whole chapter as a lunation, as a cycle of the moon. And it's why we started with a lot of these uh, early nakshastras, the, the, the constellations that are in the early part of the moon, meaning, or month, moon, the month. And then we've made this arc across the sky and what's really interesting, if, you're, if this is like piquing anybody's interest out there, it is so interesting. We're, I'm gonna, this is my attempt to actually start summarizing the end of this. In all versions of this, Sanskrit, Tibetan, and two of the Chinese, the later two, there's always 32 bodhisattvas. Uh, Manjushri is gonna come in at number 32. 32 is kind of an auspicious number in Buddhism. There's 32 chapters to the Diamond Sutra, 32 chapters to the Vajra Sutra. The Buddha is said to have 32 auspicious marks or Lakshana. Manjushri is very closely associated with this number 32. So when you hear there's 32 Bodhisattvas and you hear Manjushri comes in at number 32, you're like, oh yeah, that makes perfect sense. Totally. Yeah, we're kind of, it's like a, it's like a Vajra Sutra thing. Oh, it's so cool. What you miss, though, if you go back to you go back to the year two twenty and you read Jirchen, uh, you read Jirchen. I've already mentioned how in reading this version, it's clearly an older version. There's a lot of parts that are missing. Um, it's it's it, it's fun to read this early one and to see what's not in there. What's very interesting about this in the oldest version is that there are only, um, there are only 28, 29 bodhisattvas with Manjushri coming in at this auspicious number 30. And for me, that points to the, lun the lunar nature of this chapter a lot. 
that in the original version, they, uh, the uh, moon hanging in midair, all of these lunar mansions. Um, I think that's a lot of what was going on or is going on with the chapter. So just something kind of beautiful to think about there. Um, I'm going to jump to, well, yeah, unfortunately, Rat <laughs> Ratna Mudra Hasta, um, Jewel Mudra Hand, Jewel Mudra Hand is talking about um, basically abandonment of the world and being liberated from the world and all of that. That's a dualism. And then, man, I didn't get, I don't have enough time to talk about Mani Kutaraja, Bodhisattva Mani Kutaraja. The bodhisattva that wears reality like a jewel in their turban. Bodhisattva that wears reality like a jewel in their headdress. That's this bodhisattva who says orthodoxy, heterodoxy, right? The right way, the wrong way. That's a total dualism, right? So that's very funny and interesting, profound. And then finally, this culmination, after all these bodhisattvas, after we've abandoned even knowledge and ignorance and all of these things, we arrive at this bodhisattva, Satyananda, Satyananda, bodhisattva who delights in the truth. Bodhisattva who delights in the truth. He's smiling and interesting that bodhisattva who delights in the truth, funny that he should say it's dualistic to speak of true and false. <laughs> when one sees truly, one does not ever see any truth. So how could one see falsehood? How is this? One does not see with the physical eye one sees with the eye of wisdom. And with the wisdom eye, one sees only insofar as there is neither sight nor non-sight. There, where there is neither sight nor non-sight, that is the entrance to non-duality. When the bodhisattvas had given their explanations, they all addressed the crown prince, Manju Shri, and said, Manju Shri, what is the bodhisattva's entrance to non duality? Then the crown prince, Manju, Shri, Manju Shri replied, Friends, you have all spoken very well. Nevertheless, all your explanations are themselves dualistic. To know no one teaching, to express nothing, to say nothing, to explain nothing, to announce nothing, to indicate nothing, to designate nothing. That is the entrance to non-duality. So on my mural here, you might see all the bodhisattvas have their little thought bubbles of wisdom with their view, with their drishti, with their teaching. And Manju Sri says, Friends, you have all spoken very well, but nevertheless, all your explanations are themselves dualistic. To know no one teaching. To express nothing, to say nothing, to point to nothing, to indicate nothing. That is the entrance to non-duality. And thereupon, the Lichavi Vimalakirti kept his silence, saying nothing at all. The crown prince, Manjushri, applauded the Lichavi Vimalakirti. Excellent, excellent, noble sir. 
This is indeed the entrance into the non-duality of all bodhisattvas. Here, there is no use for syllables, sounds, or even ideas. And when these teachings had been declared, 5,000 bodhisattvas entered the Dharma door of non-duality and attained the tolerance for the birthlessness of all things. All right, folks, we have a few minutes to digest that. Anything bubble up to the top? Ideas, comments, questions? It's, um, it's kind of like when you were making that, that analogy about the alphabet where it's like you can't learn just a without having the context of the whole alphabet it's sort of like you can't learn non-duality without the context of the duality bodhisattva tania excellent yeah it's starting to make some sense <laughs> i can i can hear that A lot to digest. A lot of bodhisattvas. Any any questions? Uh, that was beautiful. I I'm spe I'm speechless. So so what does the moon have to do with all this exactly? Yeah, you know that's a great question. It's sort of one thing to sort of you know pick up some clues and be like, oh, they might be talking uh, astral astrally they might be talking about that just to pick that up is one thing then to ask your question the bigger question is like okay so what's with all of that right um uh, you know unfortunately it's i you know i could launch into a dissertation i could launch into this beautiful dissertation about the moon and buddhism um, there's a beautiful euphemism or, or name of this idea of the uh, moon-faced Buddha. And what I'll just, there's, there's probably tons of, of knowledge and information that is lost on me, lost on Michael Tav, lost on all of us in a way. There's just clearly so much being indicated with these bodhisattvas and their names and all of that. So I'm not even going to... I can't even attempt it, but I do want to drop this one on you. And it's a beautiful uh, analogy. I guess it's an analogy. And it's an analogy of the Buddha, but actually more about the Dharma, the teachings and the wisdom and all of that, as being like the moon in the way that everybody sees it equally like at the same time like your like your moon is my moon and and it's all the same moon there's a certain thing going on with with that idea in buddhism of like that the that the moon's light shines on all equally and yes i know this is true of the sun and there's uh, virochana and the sun-faced buddha and the same idea goes for the sun too but the idea of the beauty in particular of like a full moon that is in, that's in there somehow the so this analogy of of yeah of of like that it's so great the right if you think about the moon it's so great and i mean that in a maha way like it's so big it's so wonderful it's so great but it's so great it's so big that like i am here and my friends in new york and you see, it's like, wow. So that sort of beautiful wonderfulness of the moon is analogous to the beautiful wonderfulness of the Dharma and the teachings that sort of are available to all, shine equally in all, are available to all, are right there in that way. So that's one moon thing. But man, again, again, I would love to just 
shower you with moon rays, you know, for hours. So thanks for the question. Yeah, that was a great question. Yeah, and I, I encourage everybody to, you know, I drop those things. I say these things because I want everybody, you know, to have them in your, back, in your back pocket or in the back of your mind or whatever. So, because you might find something I didn't find and you might be like, oh, this, you know, so um, I don't always have a, great answers to why, you know, these things of, you know, Bodhisattva full moon or whatever. Um, but I like to point them out. So. All right, folks. Oh, I think I did. I name them all at least. I think I named them all. I sped through a few, but I almost did all the bodhisattvas. So that's wonderful. Thank you all for entering the Dharma door of non-duality, passing through. It's so wonderful. Thank you, Michael, for pointing it out to us. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, you Michael. Yeah. You know, it's possible if we listen to Manjushri that the best way to point at this stuff is to be perfectly silent. But I, for one, am glad that you're here using words over the internet to <laughs> point it out to us. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, actually, on that, I have to say this because I can't, I'll miss my opportunity. There, it's, a very, it's kind of a, an important point to make. Way back in the goddess chapter, when the goddess, that's uh, chapter seven, when the goddess was going back and forth, back and forth with Shariputra, they reached a certain point where the goddess was like uh, something to the effect of, um, and you know, and what has the the what has the elder attained, or something about the nature of the of Shariputra's enlightenment, and Shariputra goes. And he doesn't say anything. And the goddess is like, why aren't you saying anything? Hey, it's your turn, buddy, speak. It's important to note that because now in this chapter, the Malakirti, he doesn't say anything and everybody's like, excellent, excellent. And so, you know, somewhere Shariputra's like, wait, wait a minute, that was my answer. Why does he give the applause? And it's a very important point to make, uh, Katie, Katie regard, because you kind of prompted me, which is this idea that the, the noble silence of the Malakirti, as it's called, it's not that that is like the answer and that you can always get away with that. It's only Upaya, once all of this has happened and Manju Shri has kind of set that up, then there's nowhere else to go. But with the goddess and Shariputra, they had, lot, they had a lot more to go before the silence. Like he opted out early. So I wanted, you, I wanted to point out that there's people that talk a lot about that idea of the silence, that it's not always upayak that way. So thanks again for setting me up. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime. Um, okay, so there are, uh, speaking of setting you up, there's a link in the chat to Michael Owens's website where you can uh, access like audio recordings of this class. Um, and he's also available to teach. So if you have more questions, or I personally am really curious about that little tag on the Heart Sutra and that Bodhisattva, I definitely want to learn more about that. There's just so much to ask you about. Um, and so you can do that. Uh, go to his website and you can book some time with him if you want. And also please donate to the Dharma Collective. Um, you may have heard this week that we decided uh, for this period of time when we are digital only to give up our physical space um, with the goal to land back in the mission once we can meet up again. Um, but we are still paying rent on the space through the end of the month. Uh, so please donate what you can. Uh, and if you can't, just keep coming back. And uh, that's all for now. I'll see you all on Thursday. Night, everyone. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everybody. Night, Michael. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Thanks. Yay! Oh, yay. Dharma <laughs> joy. Dharma <laughs> joy. Yay.